Welcome back to the Nutramedical Report. Always amazing guests. And, of course, regularly we have Harley Schlanger on. Harley, you've got lots of important news to cover. The story continues to evolve, and we are heading down, as I say, spiraling down to the open maw of a volcano of economic disaster. But the ultimate goal is population reduction of the world. Uh, fill yeah. us in on the details and how there is a solution. We've talked about it before, Glass-Steagall and other policies. Uh, I love your organization because it deals with solutions, and we don't want to put the specific uh, titles on it, socialist. Uh, uh, we don't have ca- capitalism anymore. We have corporatism. We have fascism, the fusion of government on a global scale, and corporations transnationally. We do not have capitalism anymore. We don't even have any compassionate socialism. We, you know, Obamacare is a perfect example and with the Glass-Steagall policies, they try to feign stupidity, but in fact the intent is ultimately malevolently evil against the population of this nation and every nation on earth. Well, I think that's the point that Americans have to realize, which is that the goal is not entirely ideological. That is, there are socialists and left progressives out there <laughs> Excuse me, you think the solution would be nationalization or government takeover of everything. But that's a very small group of people. Then you also have a group of people who are ideologically conservative, who believe that we should shut down government and let the free market take care of everything else. And, you know, for the most part, that's a small group, but we, their policies have enabled the banks to move into the vacuum as government has been scaled back. And by government, I mean the kind of government our founding fathers had. What, what we have today is something that George Washington wouldn't recognize, and not because it's bloated or anything of the sort, but because it's controlled by the kind of monopoly cartels that we made the revolution against. Our American Revolution was against the British Empire. It was against a monarchy which gave out the monopoly to the British East India Company and a number of other trading companies and banks to determine what should be the investment policy, the money policy, and so on for the colonies. And our colonies, the American colonies, rebelled. And what Washington set up was not a government that was so small that it couldn't function. He was not that stupid. He said, we're going to have government, but the government is going to have specific purposes, and one of those purposes will be to protect the individual, the individual entrepreneur, farmer, businessman, worker, from the power of private cartels. And this has evolved over our history, the most recent evolution being Glass-Steagall in the 1930s to, to cut back banking uh, imperial uh, cartels. And what we've seen in the last 20 years, uh, 30 years, has been a chipping away at that policy to the point that today there's no effective regulation. Dodd-Frank is a joke. The banks don't fear it. They're happy with it. In fact, under Dodd-Frank, I think we talked about this two weeks ago, but under Dodd-Frank, in their so-called bank resolution clause, in other words, what do you do when you find a bank that's uh, uh, insolvent? If it's a very big bank, what you do is you let it take the depositors' deposits. That's allowed now under Dodd-Frank and the new FDIC rules, the so-called bail-in, or what we call quantitative stealing. So that's not regulation that's just theft and fraud right. regulation with the original glass steagall would essentially say we mean the government and the people are not on the line for all the bad debt the derivative debt the credit default swaps the mortgage backed securities and so on that the speculative gamblers and swindlers of the financial system have put on the backs of the taxpayers with this bailout instead they're going to have to eat that bad debt And if they want some salt and pepper and ketchup and mayonnaise, maybe the taxpayers will provide that, but they're going to have to eat it. The American people are not going to take that if we get Glass-Steagall. So that's, that's, I think, the lead issue is stopping the empire's swindle. It's it's basically established a global financial powerhouse, but, but it's a powerhouse that's a house of cards because it's bankrupt. Now, what will happen, of course, if you have Glass-Steagall, you'll see in a public uh, forum where Obama's speaking in his lectern with his uh, teleprompters, you'll see his head actually physically pop off. 
just like a bobblehead that loses a spring. And smoke because, will come out. And smoke will come out because you'll see behavior Sulfur that smoke. will be... Right, because right now he's Mr. Cool. He's a late-night TV host that pretends to be president. Yeah, I really is totally incompetent. I call him a rookie. But he's following the script exactly of his masters. And uh, Glass-Steagall is the bulwark of the global order. Once that happens, the whole the host of cards, the Jenga game, is over. It's over, isn't it? Well, it would be over already, except for the fact that <clears throat> under Bush and Cheney and Paulson, we had a protection of Wall Street in the city of London under the whole European system, the European Union, with the European Central Bank run by a Goldman Sachs alumnus. They've done the same thing, protect the banks and the speculators. And since Obama's been in, that's all he's done. Obama, yeah. Geithner, now Jack Lew from Citicorp. <laughs> he's had one after another of the swindlers and pirates in the technical positions, including Bernanke, and then Obama, who's a total puppet, but a thug. He's not... See, Obama is not a weakling, and this is something that Republicans, yeah, he's not, I uh, think... Uh, yeah, they, they, he's they, a, they didn't understand. He's terrorized the Democratic Party. Yeah, in fact, uh, if anything, he is uh, more malicious, more backbiting, and more... Cunning in terms of his viciousness than any politician I've seen for a long time. Uh, he has he almost this, makes this, Cheney look like a grandfather figure. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but he has this kind of external Teflon appearance that he's very passive, but he's not. He has the opposite of passivity. No, he, according to White House staffers, he throws fits. He gets spiteful and bitter. We know that he hates LaRouche and would, would uh, if he could send a drone into LaRouche's house, he would do it. And right. we know also that he's got the kind of thin skin mentality that's typical of the, this uh, narcissist, that when people don't bow down to him and don't acknowledge that he's the smartest, the cleverest, the, the, the best cool guy around, he loses it. When there was an article written that he was a bad basketball player and he, he couldn't make outside shots, the two of the pro players who were at the, with him that day who gave that report have never heard from him again. So, you know, this is yeah, not yeah. a gentle, loving uh, patriarch. This is a nasty, bitter man who yeah. is given the power by people like George Soros, who's an agent of the crown, uh, by the move-on operation, by uh, the purchase of, of media people, hundreds of millions of dollars of laundered money, laundered drug money, went in to get them elected. And, you know, I've been talking in the last days with black caucus members, and they're still afraid to say something against him because they're afraid that he'll use the ethics committee of the House of Representatives to frame them up and throw them out the way he tried to do with Charlie Rangel. Right. And so anybody that opposes him, including inside the Democratic Party, uh, and now that he thinks he has what, a mandate, which he has a very narrow one, based on uh, voter fraud and ACORN, which is an illegal organization, uh, this man is basically hell-bent on bringing about his communist collectivist policies, which really aren't communist. It's a fusion of communism and Sunni Islam uh, and global corporatism and a form of global Islamic fascism that is very malevolent, and it's not good for anybody. It's not good for our nation. It's not good for the well, you world. You see, I, I, the one thing I would disagree with that is I don't buy into this thing that he's Islamic. He has the view toward Islam that the British elite do, which is that it's well, no, no, I, he's a very he's, he's but a person, just like the, religion the Muslim Brotherhood is. A, but the Muslim Brotherhood was invented in Britain in 1928, so he has a particular version, which is an extreme Wahhabist right. Islam supporting exactly. version. He's not the the mild Islamic people that just want to be, a, let's say, an Islamic doctor in Tennessee. No, no. He, he has a malevolent British globalist view of Islam as a tool for globalism. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That very, very nasty version. Back in a moment with Harley Schlanger. That's scary. Even his own people. Wow. Yeah. Welcome back. And Harley, I, you made a comment just a second ago. I think it needs to be repeated on air. Uh, that Obama is so bizarre that he won't even talk to his own people if he, they don't agree with him. If he knows well, in advance is, that yeah. they. 
Yeah, this is very really bizarre. This is not the kind of leadership. This is not leadership. This is divide and conquer. This is a dictator, a fuhrer in the making. And all he needs is a crisis. It can be anything from New Madrid superquake. Uh, it could be an American Fukushima. It could be a disaster like an avian pandemic. Literally, a hair trigger system is now set up with the National Defense Authorization Act that he claimed he didn't want when he actually insisted it. And there are several senators uh, that came forward and said, no, no, he insisted he wanted this. And then he said publicly he wasn't going to and then he signed it. Uh, and then the well, executive orders he's done, like the uh, uh, Appropriations yeah. Act, etc. I mean, this man is a socio-psychopath, and I'm telling you, he would make a good Nesferatu. Uh, he would make a good Dracula. I mean, this guy is very scary. He's the guy, I'm definitely sure, if he wasn't president, you wouldn't want to meet him in an alleyway uh, in any dark corner of a city. Well, I can tell you one that there, I, I, off the air, just so people know, we were talking about reactions in the African American community because I do a number of radio programs that are considered African American stations, and right, you yeah. know, people used to object sometimes to what I was saying, or there would be times I'd be on with Keisha Rogers, who's African American, and people would say, "Well, come on, Keisha, you can't treat the brother that way." Uh, and she said, I don't know about you, but he's not my brother. But yeah, yeah. what happened in the last couple of days is that we're seeing a decisive turn from a section of the Democratic Party, which, you know, and here's something that's ironic, and I'll, I'll tell you this because it's, it's really quite funny. MoveOn.org, which was set up primarily to elect Obama, it was set up with millions of laundered money from George Soros, and George Soros gets a lot of money from Mexican drug dealers. Yeah. So MoveOn.org, which did everything it could to elect Obama in 2008, including uh, they worked with Acorn and others to flood the caucuses with people who were illegal. And by illegal, I mean they took people from Indiana and Illinois into the Iowa caucuses, so Obama won the Iowa caucuses in 2008, and that set him on his way. So they have been the most pro-Obama. They're now mobilizing against him, and I, I sent them, a, they, they asked, solicited me for money, and I just said, uh, you know, you, you may be the last people in America who come to realize what idiots you were in 2008, 2012. Well, his, his, his destruction rate from the black in the, in the, in the uterus uh, to his current policy of passing a uh, morning after pill to 15 year olds with a prescription to his policies against uh, employment, which is literally killing business, especially for the black community. They're hit harder with unemployment than, than anybody else. They're not getting a free Obama phone and they're, you know, as they say, it was a poll back uh, over a century ago, a chicken in every pot. What Obama's doing is destroying the middle class and uh, destroying the future. He's destroying hope. And it's amazing to me that these people are finally catching on that we don't have we don't have someone who's a social organizer that's trying to kind of allow people to have opportunities to get out of poverty and to break down the barriers between the career races. He's actually erecting barriers. Well in Obama's amazing. case, instead of a chicken in every pot, he's just giving you the pot. Only it's not a pot yeah. to cook in. <laughs> yeah, it's a pot to, to have a leak. To smoke. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yeah exactly. pot to smoke. Well, 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 but anyway, look what the this public conference call the other day with Keith Ellison, uh -huh. who's an African-American Democrat from Minnesota, a congressman, who's also a Muslim. Uh, he publicly said, I have, someone said, well, why don't you talk to him? And he said, I've tried to talk to him. Uh, he, uh, Ellison said, I and other members of the Progressive Caucus who supported him, have tried to talk with him. We've invited him to meet with us, to have a beer with us, to come out and, and have dinner with us. He's refused to. So now I'm issuing to you, you go public and say to Obama, you've got to meet with us. Now, that's how Whoa. desperate some of these Whoa, people are. Gosh. Yeah. That's now, a, his own supporters have to beg the media to get him to answer their calls and come to dinner to talk. And meanwhile, Obama goes to dinner with Republicans who want to get rid of Social Security. He goes to dinner with Republicans like John McCain, who want to get us involved in a completely insane war in Syria on the side of the terrorists. He goes to dinner with Democrats who will crawl and, and for him and go with his policies. But if you oppose him, if you turn against him, 
you become a public enemy. And one of the things that was very interesting to me yeah. is that there are people who are saying this is this makes Nixon's enemy list look like it's something mild in comparison. But I, Obama sure has that a, kind of vindictive mentality. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure in two years that the man hasn't been impeached, he has a drone kill list with a number of his enemies inside the Democratic Party or anybody in the media that opposes him. And then the amazing thing is if the Republicans agree, he doesn't care about destroying the Democratic Party. He'll agree with them as long as they're crazy as, as he is. Well, and that's an important point because, you know, Rush Limbaugh the other day was saying, don't fall for Obama on Social Security. He's just going for a small cut to avoid fundamental change. I mean, he's not going Are for a small kidding? cut. He's opening the door to destroy Social Security. Of course he now, is. He, he's wanted, to, wanted to, to take the sprocket off the bicycle so there's no proper rider. And in fact, there's the Social Security is something that's been paid into, and they've literally stole the money and made an IOU for it. And now they're going to basically say, well, now we're, we're not going to pay it out. How and not crazy only that, is that, but Social Security doesn't add a penny to the deficit. It has no, even if the, the budget deficit debate was legitimate, Social Security has nothing to do with it. What Obama right. is doing is going for the kill. And this has nothing Genocide. to do with supporting programs or anything of the sort. He wants government and to, to work with institutions such as the financial institutions, insurance companies, HMOs, and others, to kill off the so-called useless eaters. That's yeah. why our organization put the mustache on Obama almost four years ago, the Hitler mustache on him, and we still have it on him, because his policy from the beginning and you were one of the few people, Dr. Deagle, who picked up on this, on yeah. the health care. It wasn't about setting up some huge government-funded uh, uh, charity. It was to allow the insurance companies and the federal government to kill, to reduce right. the population it, it, in the it, name let, let, of listen, providing more care. I, I, I'm a dual citizen. I'm an American, but I lived in Canada, was naturalized, and I worked there for a part of my career before I moved to the States many years ago. And I can tell you, he wasn't trying to reproduce British or American or Australian health care or, or French or, or, or Taiwanese or Korean. He was putting in a policy of the most malevolent health care policy. He would make the Nazi doctors cringe it, how bad this Obamacare is. And that's I mean, why really his, is, chief, his chief advisor on the health care, Ezekiel Emanuel, who we called Easy Kill Emanuel. Yeah, uh, good one. His, good one. He, he is a, a Nazi doctor. He would right. be right at home with Hitler's doctors who <clears throat> set up the T4 policy to kill the so-called useless eaters in 1938-39. And by the way, 275,000 disabled people, mentally retarded people, and Down syndrome people were killed before the first Jew, the first uh, gypsy, the first black, the first uh, person that was homosexual was killed by Adolf Hitler and his Nazi doctors. So you can imagine what, what in my opinion is that the policies that he's putting in place are not socialized medicine. It's murder on steroids. It's genocide. Welcome back, and uh, Harley, you want to do an update on Syria? This, by the way, is the trigger for World War III, not North Korea. North Korea is a kind of a sidelight. It's kind of like a, a carnival show. But what's going on in the Middle East? This is really bad, and Obama's policies are nuts. Uh, please tell us what's going on. Well, you had this uh, so-called report, which they said, with more or less legitimacy. Now, that means they say more or less legitimacy, that they now have proof, well, maybe we don't, but we think we might have proof. Yeah. That I mean, like Colin Bowell and the weapons, weapons. Of, yeah, like the Colin Bowell comment of weapons of mass destruction, so we kill millions of Iraqis, uh, kill tens of thousands of Americans, mutilate a bunch more and cause a lot of traumatic brain injuries. Now the disability rate 65% plus for our veterans from Gulf 1 and 2, and these maniacs now want to go into Syria. Well, Next step, as you, as arm the hell out of the uh, al nurse al-Qaeda, and then American boots on the ground, and America's coming back with limbs blown off, brains uh, cr scrambled, and uh, uh, on uh, serotonin reuptake inhibitors ready to kill themselves and their family and their local neighbors and their community. Well, there, there are two aspects to this that are important. First of all, you have Obama saying a while back that if 
Assad uses chemical weapons against his people, that crosses the red line. Yeah. Now, in his press conference yesterday, Obama said, we do have evidence that gas has been used. We don't know where, when, or by whom. Oh, but my God. Let this be a warning. Now, <laughs> the thing with sarin gas is, you know, it disperses very quickly, so it's not as though you're going to find intense uh, 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 saturation of soil with it. So it's right. very easy to say that there was evidence of sarin gas. Number two, sarin gas is available to the Libyan al-Qaeda because they, they took over Gaddafi's storehouses with sarin gas, and they're shipping that off to Syria. Uh, but then you have the other side of this, which is that the so-called rebels are losing the war because the Syrian people have turned against them, because the leaders of the fighters of the rebels are al-Qaeda. They're Libyans, right. they're Iraqis, they're Pakistanis, and they're Chechens. There yeah, are the very, Chechens are the worst of the, of the Syrians. Lot. Right, and what happens is, what I've heard is it's less than 10% are Syrians. Uh, most of those are even have, have reduced since the, the year ago. And what we yeah. have now is the most extreme elements. Most of them are uh, people from all these other places, including prisoners released from Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and the Arab Emirates, uh, and these other countries like Chechnya and Dagestan. This is crazy. And what we're and doing is funded, Al-Nurse Al-Qaeda. Yeah, and they're funded, they're funded by... They're Go funded ahead. by the Saudis and Qatar right. and United Arab Emirates. They're being trained by the British and the Americans. Right. And what Obama is doing with this, actually, let me tell you what the Israelis did, because the Israelis are the ones who said definitively it's gas, and then the British and the French agreed, and now Obama seems to be going along with it. Oh, God. What, what the, what's, what's interesting here is that in doing this, the Israelis are basically saying, Obama, you said gas is a red line, so they crossed the red line. Are you going to do anything? Because you also said Iran having nuclear weapons would be a red line. Well, if you're not going to enforce the red line in Syria, we have no choice but to go ahead on our own and bomb Iran. And when Chuck Hagel went to Israel last week, he provided them anti-missile capabilities for the Syrian anti-aircraft and also the refueling tankers that Israel would need to launch a strike against Iran. So the Obama administration is in the background planning an intervention into Syria as a prelude for, to a total strike against Iran. Okay, um, now you can figure on the consequences of this. Number one, closure of the Strait of Hormuz and no, or as they say, the soup kitchens for, for uh, Seinfeld. No soup for you, no aura for you world. Because yeah. one-third of the oil in the world passes through the Strait of Hormuz. One-third of the entire oil supply in the world which means immediately worldwide depression and famine, worldwide catastrophe, and the regional war in the Middle East is going to involve the, Ameri the Russian biopreparate weapons, which the Syrians and Iranians have. They have other weapon systems, including super gun and other weapons that the Russians have armed them with. And Russia's not going to stand by passively, or the Chinese are certainly not going to see disruption in the Middle East, where one of their major supplies of oil now is Iraqi oil coming from the northern area of Iraq. So this isn't going to go well. This is going to well, turn into a war. Here's the other important point. Uh, LaRouche put out a statement this week saying that if McCain ever were sane, you couldn't say that about him now. He's acting yeah. crazy because oh, McCain yeah. is egging on an attack. But here's the other thing. General Dempsey, the head of the American Joint Chiefs of Staff, the chief general of the U.S. military, at a press conference said, there's no way we can fight a war in Syria. This would be bad for the U.S., and it would only encourage the jihadist forces around the world. Now, Dempsey has met with the Chinese. He's going to meet with the Russians next week. This is as close to a full break with the president on policies you can have. And Dempsey, there's a whole grouping of these people in the well, military uh, now who have, have been involved in Afghanistan and Iraq and know that there's no way out of these wars. They, they've essentially adopted General well, MacArthur's understanding that you can't win these kinds of wars with boots on the ground unless you're prepared to, to use nuclear weapons and wipe out the whole population. And exactly. Now, the other thing is there's, there's evidence that there's an internal battle going on in the government between not only the military, but between the FBI and the CIA. 
and I've seen more and more news and, and noise coming out that indicates this may well be going on, that there's actually a split and, in fact, a functional coup about to happen in the government. Well, the, the FBI is, uh, I'd say, deliberately incompetent. The FBI has been working with the jihadists internationally. To, it's a little bit like what the ATF did with David Koresh to create an excuse to go in and blow the place up. Exactly. <laughs> in other words, stand by and watch him while he while he literally uh, gets brain rot, acts like a maniac, and don't do a damn thing until disaster strikes. And then you and go then attack them. Yeah. Yeah. You go attack them head on uh, <clears throat> to create a reaction. What the FBI has done, this, there are four or five cases now. Congressman Michael McCall from Texas has brought this up in a letter. The FBI seems to be encouraging jihadists in the same way they encouraged the anti-draft movement in the 1960s to, to spill blood in draft card centers, to blow up draft boards and things of that sort. Uh, it was the FBI that instigated a lot of this. Now, there's a section of the CIA which is, I would say, relatively patriotic. There's another section of the CIA which, from back from the beginning, has been part of the Wall Street law firms. Uh, which tends to co collaborate with the FBI. But what we're seeing is a huge blind spot because the neocons have been defending the Chechens against Russia. And Putin kept saying, these guys are not your friends. Yeah. Just because they're against us doesn't mean they're your friends. Why don't you work with us? And what we're learning now in Boston, I think there were three arrests today, of people who were friends of one of the Tsarnaev brothers. You know, this is not, you, you can't just go online and, and uh, Google how to build a bomb like this. And no. especially the younger guy, he was a pothead. You know, he's not going to be able to build these things. Yeah, there was they, a, a they support had have, network. They, had a, they have three more people that they arrested, uh, apparently, or they've, they've got to run for questioning. The fact is that this was, was literally uh, shepherded. It was, uh, it, it, there was cover, FBI cover. In fact, even in a new report now, that even Saudi Arabia warned the U.S. about Tamerlan Center of. This, uh, this is... This is getting so bizarre, and the story has so many convoluted twists, like even an eyewitness showed that the police ran over this guy, Tamerlane, uh, and then shot him after they basically crushed him with their vehicle, their SUV, the police SUV. Well, and, and we know it, that Obama is giving complete uh, support to the FBI, so we know there's something wrong with them. Right, so my, my guess is uh, I, I believe that there's actual split between various agencies inside the government, which is really bad, and the military are going off because they know if this war starts, the first thing I'm going to tell you will happen, the Syrians will fire Yakon's hypersonic cruise missiles from Russian design with Russian technicians there, and the, and the Hoot super cavitation torpedoes, and our Navy sitting in the Persian Gulf is going to the bottom. And, and also our pilots who would be enforcing a no-fly zone are going to pay for it with their lives. They're going to pay for it. We're going to see a major truncation of our military sitting ducks there with uh, asymmetric technology that makes our current Navy obsolete. And when this starts to happen, the public is, is not, has been informed already on this show before this is coming. Welcome back, and Harley, uh, uh, just looking at some of the Drudge Report statements here, uh, real jobless rate above 10% most states. Uh, we're, uh, now the, uh, the economy is growing at a trickle now. It's slowed down after the first quarter. Uh, and the policies of Obama and Obamacare are going to kill the economy when it comes into full force. Uh, the uh, system needs Glass-Steagall desperately. The latest news on Drudge Report is that... Uh, the Federal Reserve is going to pump, pump, pump. That's the, if you go to drudgereport.com, uh, tell us what Lurish Foundation is talking about because we don't have a lot of time left before the bottom falls out. We see the gold attack where paper gold is literally gone, but real gold, yeah. people are going like crazy to order it for as wait as six to eight weeks to get to receive it. They're paying a premium of 30 to 50 percent above the quote, the current spot price. What's really going on is our economy is ready to have a bond run and to have a total collapse of the economy that occur, occur with any fulcrum event, an avian pandemic, H7N9, <clears throat> a uh, new Madrid fault quake, 
uh, a superstorm, literally any form of terrorist activity on American soil that's larger than the Boston bombing, will immediately have martial law and a collapse of the economy. Uh, it just takes a little while, another event, and we'll see the full flower of the Fuhrer emerge in the Fourth Reich. Well, I think the the thing I said earlier that you have a group of elites who have pretty much seize the power of the government through control over the funding of campaigns for Congress and, and the White House. But if you go to a slightly lower level, state legislatures, uh, you find in some states you have people who do the dirty work of the bankers. This is how they got interstate banking through initially. But that is not a major focus of Wall Street and in state legislatures. And now we have in 17 state legislatures, we've had bills introduced calling on the Congress to pass H.R. 129, which is the Glass-Steagall bill of Marcy Kaptur and Walter Jones. Now, as a result of that, there's a... Uh, uh, a real resonance in the Congress. They're wondering what the hell is going on, because out of the new freshman congressmen, two-thirds of them were in the state legislature before they were elected to Congress. Now, today, the Alabama House of Representatives became the fourth state to pass a resolution calling for Glass-Steagall. And so we now have uh, 13 more states with uh, resolutions before them. We're hoping to add in the next couple of days Massachusetts, New York, California, and Texas. And if you know state legislators in those states, call them up and tell them to get on board with this uh, support for H.R. 129. But the reason it works on the state level is, number one, you don't have as much lobbying from the large banks. But number two, many of the people who sit as legislators are realtors. They're small businessmen. They're, they're farm equipment salesmen. They're insurance salesmen. You know, they're people who are relatively close still to the real economy. And they know that they're getting smoke blown up their rear ends when they're being told that the economy's in good shape, which is what Obama's saying. Uh, the report you just read from the Drudge Report is just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, we're, we're seeing overall a decline of physical production at an accelerating rate. And the latest uh, beige report of the Federal Reserve in Dallas was very pessimistic about the next six months. The Federal Open Market Committee met the last couple of days, and, and they said there will be no change. In other words, this is what Drudge meant by pump, pump, pump. They're going to keep pouring money into the banks to enable them to buy stocks so that people think the, the economy is in good shape. So... Uh, I would say that our mobilization for Glass-Steagall is important because Glass-Steagall is the one bill that Wall Street really fears because it would say that if you're a speculator, there will be no support for you and there's going to be an immediate shift in banking so that you're going to have to eat your own bad debt. No one's going to bail Question. you out. And nobody's going to allow the bailing in either. I mean, this the fact that it was in the Dodd-Frank bill. The Canadian Parliament did the same thing. The Bank of England and exactly. London yeah. and the FDIC all have these same policies, so it's a transnational policy is obscene. It's, it, it, instead of a quantitative easing, it's quantitative stealing. Yeah, and what they've said is that you take a risk when you put money in the bank. Well, in fact, part of the original Glass-Steagall was the FDIC. And the point of the FDIC was what's called bank resolution, which is if a bank is carrying too many bad assets compared to its, uh, what, it, its, uh, what it owes, then you resolve it. You put it through bankruptcy reorganization, and under the FDIC laws, initially 100000 in, in deposits is protected. Now it's 250000 but what the new Dodd-Frank bill allows, and this is what the FDIC and the Bank of England initially proposed, it actually came from UBS, the Union Bank of Switzerland, first. And that's what was done in Cyprus. The bail-in policy says that if banks are in trouble, instead of going to the governments and central banks, they should go to their investors. Now, when you put money in a bank for a checking account, did you think you were investing in that bank, or did you think the bank was protecting your money so you could draw on it on demand? Well, now I, we're finding a, under absolutely. the Dodd-Frank bill that that's an investment. 
and you're about to lose. And in, in Cyprus, they just finalized it. If you have over 100,000 euros in the bank, they can take 37.5% of that and give you, in return, stock in the bankrupt bank. And then they froze a second 22.5%. So 60% of your assets are no longer under your control. And of the other 40%, you can't take out very much at any one time. So that yeah. was what was done in Cyprus. That's coming here. Right. In other words, if your money's in a bank, uh, I would say credit union would be an alternative. But if your money's in one of these big, uh, not too fail, big to fail banks, you can assume that they're going to, at the very least, put controls on how much money you can pull out of that bank per day. Yeah, and that's that's where we're headed. We're we're one bad derivatives bet away from that happening, because the idea that the banking system in this country is stabilized, I, I talked with a top Federal Reserve banker about a week and a half ago, and he was saying, well, we have relative stability, things seem to be moving pretty well, and I said, well, the stock market's a bubble, and the real estate investment trusts mean they're enabled to buy up mortgage-backed securities again, that's another bubble, what's going on with the real economy? And he said, we're in deep shit. And that was a Federal Reserve uh -huh. official. Yeah, in other words, what we need is just one bad debt. Then they're going to try to go to take people's deposits. You'll see a deposit run of people trying to get their money. You're going to see a political disaster. And then you're going to see basically, in the sense of bank holiday, which is not a holiday at all, it's literally a banking martial law. And the banking martial law, I believe we're going to see a parallel between this. The, 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 remember now, the globalists only have two possibilities, either... They have either they, they do something like this financially because the system isn't working in the way they're going, it's not going to work, or they bring us to war. And with Obama's latest move this week, he's bringing us to war. Yeah, the war is a consequence of their inability to control things through normal channels. And exactly. war and chaos. You see, uh, the sequestration debt ceiling debate, they're trying to revive a debt ceiling debate, the uh, fiscal cliff, all of these things are diversions. But they don't last very long. A war is a really big diversion. Yeah, exactly. In other words, they need a war to move forward their social policies. This goes right back to Nimrod in Genesis, where he was a mighty man in the face of God. He would send his rabble in to cause death and destruction to a town, city, or district. Then he sent his own army to clear up the rabble and said, I will uh, take care of you and make me your emperor, your king. And that's how Nimrod took over basically Babylon and the ancient world. Well, we have... A lot of that ancient barbarity in our world today, but they're vulnerable and they can be defeated. And I would encourage yes. everyone to go to the LaRouchePack.com website and to call our number to find out what you can do to get your state to pass a Glass-Steagall resolution. Because as I said, we now have four states that passed it, 13 more that are considering it. So give us a call. You can, If you want to talk to me, you can just ask for me. It's 800 922 2907 and become part of our solution oriented mobilization to get Glass Steagall in to bankrupt the historic enemy of the United States of Wall Street and the City of London. So it's 800 922 2907. We're in the office now. We're mobilizing today and we'd be delighted to talk to you and get you uh, in our mobilization with us. One more time 800 922 2907. Call today. The window is closing. The door is closing on the opportunity to deal with this because the next level is a series of disasters that are promulgated, amplified, and shepherded to create a total chaos situation. And the ultimate goal of Obamacare and the Fed Reserve and the collapse of the financial system, which is on purpose, is genocide. If you get that one understanding, Glass-Steagall and these other policies are essential for saving mankind and our nation. Call today. Thanks a lot. Amazing. Okay, we'll talk to you early. next week. You bet. Hour two coming up, hour three. Professor James McCanny. You don't want to miss it. Back in a